part two of our discussion. <laughs> be, if, I, if I don't remember to split it up, that'll be awkward to be like. But so hopefully this is a separate episode yeah. uh, to, to put out there as well. Getting into Guardians 3, we naturally uh, kind of got to a place with, with Ant-Man Quantumania with, that triggered this discussion too. Um, awesome. Wonderful. Kind of like this, this movie for me actually shot up to one of my favorite MCU movies oh, right it's away. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought one of the things right away, uh, as far as the themes that we find in here, uh, one of them right away is authenticity as a person, because the story itself is all about emphasizing who, you know, who the characters are and right at mm-hmm. the end, I mean, for example, when Nebula tells Drax, you know, you're not a destroyer, you're dad, for example. And oh, that my part God, of his yes. personality that comes out in the story of like, wow, here's this big, tough guy that, you know, in the beginning is like jailed for essentially, you know, murder, terrorism, you know, and mm-hmm. all of that. But, but, but again, see. it all goes back to the loss of his daughter, right? Yes, yes. So it, right. It, it's, it's been his way of, he hasn't been a dad and he's been lashing out. And he's, yes. so, yeah, I definitely, like I saw definitely the parallels between it and, um, and Quantumania in terms of this idea of dealing with the past and overcoming and seeing how the past shapes you, but also in terms of like, again, overcoming even what's been put upon you. And Drax is a great example yes. of this idea that, you know, he, he's looked down upon as not being all that bright. And it's like, it's not about not being bright. It's, well, the whole thing, you didn't tell us you spoke that language. I never asked. <laughs> I never asked. And I, and Mantis is uh little rant against him was uh, a lot of the times when these things are meant to be comedy. And that is the mm-hmm. one some people don't really like a lot of comedy in their stories or whatever. For some reason, I don't identify with that. So I don't understand it. Yeah. However, I think when people aren't focused on that, they miss the little message that's buried in there. So when Mantis is saying, yeah, he's stupid, but he's lovable. He makes us laugh. And mm-hmm. uh, he's, you know, why are you so obsessed with competence? Which of course he's at that point, like, I, what, what are you saying about me? <laughs> yeah. This is not sounding the like, the com- like the compliment that you think it is. Like, when, you know. when she makes the comment though, she says, and he's the only one of you all who doesn't hate himself. And I thought, wow, mm-hmm. that's a pretty profound thing because I did find this story has, I mean, self-acceptance is woven into each yeah. of these characters and some of whom yeah, I think we're not going to see again in the, in the movie series zizzes uh, of yeah. the MCU. Uh, some of them are stepping aside. And incidentally, by the way, I also enjoyed one of the things I did enjoy about this that I think is, is good storytelling towards this point of authenticity and self-acceptance mm-hmm. is that they did not fall into what oftentimes superhero genres do, which is, uh, as I said in Quantum Mania, retirement equals death. You die, mm-hmm. you have a noble exit, and the character and the actor get to you know embrace that. And they, in this case, they're like, no, actually, there's some that are moving out of the active hero role to be a hero in different ways, to raise a group yeah. of orphans, to uh, build a community, you know, to reconnect with grandpa, you know, as it is for mm-hmm. for Star Lord well- to try to figure out who they are. And, and it was interesting, too, because I remember when they sort of, you know, when they settle on nowhere and it is that weird thing. And we saw it in the in the, the Christmas special you see here where it's this whole weird. Well, there again, it's that weird plateau like we're supposed to be heroes. And then that's the kind of what we're used to. And now we're doing I mean, I still remember from the Christmas special thing. There was like the whole there's Star Lord, like signing some sort of like requisition. It's like he's like the, you know, <laughs> bill of lading. He's the shipping and receiving guy, you know, kind of like, really. Yeah. Um, you know? But you see how that has you know, again, in this movie, uh, the manifestation of, again, the dealing with the past and deal. And it's interesting you say too, about the idea of, um, you know, who they are. And so the fact that they have this, the, the other Gamora there and her saying, you know, I'm not who you think I am. I'm not this other thing. And, you know, and so, so stop putting, projecting her onto me at the same time, she ends up learning, uh, you know, as a result of this whole thing, there's the, you know, those moments. And it's like, okay, I have some insight into this, who this alternate me mm-hmm. is. And I appreciate it differently, and thank, and and, that, and also at the same time that parallel thing where it's like, okay, he's been able to speak to her, move on, accept it, and then go off and do his own thing. But like, yeah, that that the self acceptance because I mean, he's always had the issues of abandoning his father, you know, his family with what with what happened, being kidnapped, and then again, all of all of his daddy issues. And again, I, I still sure. I still love Jennifer's like whole little rant around daddy issues in the MCU. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> in, in She Hulk, sorry. Um, yeah, but, if it wasn't but for him Daddy dealing issues. with them and, he, and, and dealing with his grandfather and being able to go back and find his grandfather and realizing that his grandfather, again, turns out was in fact, did miss him and was in fact protecting him at that time. Yeah. He was again just doing it with the toolkit of a man in that era of his generation yes. <laughs> who was also emotionally distraught. So, so could grandpa have done it better? Absolutely. But the problem was, is that that was literally the last experience he had yeah. with him. And so that's what Peter took away as opposed to, you know, what might've happened where it would be, okay, sorry, you know, I'm uh, yeah. grandpa was a bit of a dick and, you know, didn't handle that well. I'm upset too. I love well, you. Really I just one moment. I mean, that. we don't have any yeah. indication that he was jerky other than that. I don't no, know. But it was just that he was, right. it was left. Exactly. But it was, it's that proverbial, you know, the last, yeah. you know, it's like the same thing you say, like, how did you know there was going to be the last phone call with someone or the last conversation? Absolutely. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you had that with him. Um, I, I, also the self-loathing that Rocket goes through, like that was the other yes. part. Like I was, I knew there was going to be some backstory. Um, I didn't know if it had gone down the, like the TMI backstory, <laughs> like in terms of the, oh, this is getting like really weird, gross, um, you know, on some level, but at the same time, it makes sense because we've always dealt with rocket some way in this idea about like what's happened to me and I'm not this thing. The only, I'm the only one like me. And, mm -hmm. you know, his weird obsession with needing people's prosthetics. Um, and, <laughs> yes. And then you get there and you're like, Oh, wait a second. He's been this meta, like this metaphor. And now what we're seeing are the, the characters like, yes, he's got some scar tissue, but he's the internalized version of it. But now we're seeing who, you know, what was happening to everyone else. And it's like, You've got, you know, an animal that's supposed to swim, but it's been, you know, dealt with in a way that it's now in a wheelchair. Yes. And you've got, you know, a bunny losing its hopping legs to have weird, creepy, you know, spider legs and all of these other kinds of things where you're like, there's no rational reason for making those kinds of changes mm -hmm. to, to any of these things. Like you weren't, you weren't improving, you know, the bunny's right. ability to get around. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. So, and it was funny because my son and I had a conversation around this and I said, but that's exactly the point. Here's somebody that's, as Rocket put it, you, you didn't like the way things were and you just wanted to change it to your way. It wasn't necessarily about improving things, making it better. And, and so that's exactly what so many things in our world are about is we go to change things and it's not really an improvement. It's something else. And this just shows how much of a monster like that was that opportunity to show the monstrosity of that that somebody's not doing it for the reasons that they say because how is that clearly an improvement on a bunny yes or an otter yeah, like i mean they have that, otters that's the thing like otters are known for their dexterity right and it's like you're going to do that to an otter i really? have thought about that it's very very that's a very interesting point but that's a clear step down in yeah the, yeah like these these were not the upgrades you thought they were yeah <laughs> And, or again, uh, an boy. animal that swims and rendering them, you know, having to get around in a wheelchair or again, a bunny hopping, like they're, they're not improvements, you know? It's this interesting. And like, let's make the bunny hop higher. Are we going, you or know, reproduce maybe, more. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we are, oh, that's true. None of them had the things that made them, that makes the actual animals have, a, a, you know, those, oh, that's very interesting. Well, also, and, and, and then at the same time too, like his, his intellectual stuff to see him. Yeah. And, and the fact that he was the one that, you know, as literally as the, and, and you saw this with more of a childlike voice. So here's, you know, young him that he's both this tool and this thing. And yet at the same time, when he's, you know, basically being told that he's going to be made obsolete, we've, we've got the next level. We just haven't figured out this thing. And then he's just like, boom, 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 boom. And he's got all the answers or you're seeing him with the, you know, all, all the, um, the equations. And you're like, okay, that's not a side of rocket we've ever seen. And that he never really discusses it, admits to it, or you, and you sort of look back and go, okay, how many times were there problem solving situations where he actually came at it that way? And we just don't know because it's almost like he didn't want people to know he was smart. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. There was, uh, uh, and, and I may be delving a little deep here, but that is interesting that all his friends had prosthetics. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, who knows? <laughs> is there an, is there a, an attachment there? But the thing that is very interesting there is we know that Rocket, as was highlighted in number two in his exchange with, with Yondu, where he's like, you're pushing people away, in essence, being that controlling person with a wall around him. 
Uh, and then the line, which I think was probably summing up a big message of the whole movie, obviously, when he says, as you quoted, you know, to the high evolutionary, you didn't want to make things perfect. You just didn't like them the way they were. And yeah. and a very uh, – I, I plug this a lot and mention this a lot. Uh, the, there's a book called Monkey Traps, which is all about the concept of addiction to control. Steve Hauptman yeah. wrote this. So he's the author, and he was on the my show years ago, probably one of my earlier uh, guests, and we still – you know, Facebook friends and all that. And he's got a, a group on Facebook, the Monkey Traps group, if anybody wants to seek that out. But, uh, and, you know, they're always kind when I post episode links. So, you know, but anyway, <laughs> so that idea of being addicted to control and you look at the high evolutionaries whole character. And oh. this is probably one of, some people are saying the most effective villains, you know, in the, in the MCU. And in fact, I I think that one of the things is, as uh, I've said, I said in our last episode, a lot of the bad guys are like, "Oh, I have a greater cause," mm -hmm. and that greater cause essentially lets me be powerful and be a bully. Now, with the high evolutionary, I feel like the being powerful and being bully, a uh, being a bully, is there, and it's not that he doesn't thrive off of that. But I feel like that is secondary to his actual sincerity, which is even scarier. You know, mm -hmm. Thanos appeared sincere and said things that were sincere to his, but his whole, his whole thing was kind of based on, you know, the BS assumption that this is the only thing I can do is yeah. this. And it's for the it greater wasn't. good. And I've gaslit myself enough to believe it. Right. Well, th th exactly. That's the whole thing. Like he, he makes like Thanos and Kang in some respects look like, you know, I mean, they're pretty intense, but I mean, he takes the control freak thing up to a whole other sure. Level. <laughs> Zero hesitation to wipe out a whole planet that he, by mm -hmm. the way, created. The way they wouldn't be there without him, but he's still, you know. And so you see, you see uh, that that strong addiction to the point of absolutely hurting others, right? Yeah, um, and wanting to be a god like that, yes. and taking that god, and, and well, and, and even taking that godlike thing to another level. Because as much as you get Thanos, you know, wiping folks out, and again you know, turning his kids into little experiments, um, you know, and, and then you get Kang and again, playing with the timeline and oh, I'm just going to clean it all up. And if it means wiping out folks, that's, it's, this is about tidying it up in the greater good. And you're like, this is a dude that is like literally creating and destroying planets as little, as literally as like lab experiments and the, Oh, well that didn't work out the way I wanted to just blow it up. And this, you know, and then we're going on and, and, and that whole thing about, you know, and even when his own people stand up to him with the, like, we've got, you know, they're all bought in to the whole, like, but we've got the next experiment and you're like obsessed with chasing down literally this one creature. And he's, he's like, boss, we got to get over to this place and how they're, they were, you know, in a sense going to overthrow him because, they were so used to, again, the plan, the plan, the plan, that watching him go off and be this, you know, yes, he's still a control freak, but he's erratic and he's he's going against his own mission. So we have to, you know, <laughs> go, go and the priority is founding the other planet, the next experiment, blah, 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 blah. Exactly. And we're going to have a rebellion to do it. We've been so yeah. controlled by you. We're going to usurp you <laughs> to fulfill the mission. <laughs> I will say, too, from a, I don't, I don't know if human nature is the right word because they're all aliens, yeah. but... Uh, that is something that is a recurring question and that I always I always think it's funny in movies. In my mind, I'm always like, why does anyone work for this person? You know, it's like, why? They just watched him kill one of the other people. Are you that, like, like all 200 of you are that scared that one of you doesn't try to sneak away or whatever? Um, anyway, but to have his whole crew turn against him, I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that's actually, that also is the sign to where the control and the pursuit of control ultimately backfires because people will turn and people will resist. And it's like, Hey, you know, I know that you're the all powerful master of this whole project, but you know what? You do suck. And this has gone too mm -hmm. far, um, you know, kind of thing to where he is ultimately left alone when the thing he wants most of all is to create a perfect community. And here he is like sacrificing all of that in the supposed pursuit of that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the idea too that there's there's almost like a like a jealousy, and even even that rant that he goes on with Ra uh, you know Rocket, like, like how dare you be the one that had the answer to this thing? Because I think that's the other thing too is that he again in that in that godlike role, whether he's created each of the beings there, he has altered them. I mean, again, whether it's the you know the little 
things or something's clearly in their brain or whatever else. Like it's the idea that I am God among all of you and you've all followed me in a sense, probably because they're like programmed, gaslit, you know, wired, whatever you want to call it (laughs) to do that. So again, the standing up to him is like the, Oh, that's in a sense going against the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at the same time, it's, it's this idea that, yeah, like he's just, he's so caught up in all of that. And then it's the, how dare rocket be the thing. So there's again, that, like a, a jealousy and insecurity, because again, if I am this supreme God, I've made myself a God. How dare you as one of my, not even one of my better creations. Like, you know, <laughs> you are, you're, you're from the, you know, like, again, that's, that's, you're, you're the 1.0 and I'm at 4.0 right now in terms of the iterations of experiments. Like, how dare you be the one and, and just that vengeance that he's got. And again, that, just that idea that how much it eats him up and well, and even to what, what rocket had done to him. And, and so, yeah, and you see the face and you're like, oh, okay, now I, I, know, I know why the face is there. But again, that facade, that mask of everything has got to be perfect. So I've even upgraded myself. I've even, you know, done these and that things. that thin veneer that, yeah. of that face. And literally, right, it can mask. be peeled off. It's, just, it's like, oh, wow, a lot of ugliness under here. And, you know, I, not, to, not to get, but it was designed to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, an, an ugliness that was, I mean, that's an old trope. Not not the biggest fan of uh, a, a villain having to have you know physical scarring to be a villain and all that. I mean, I yeah. just want to. I guess I'll just put that out there. I have a sensitivity to that. Uh, however, it was interesting to say it didn't look like it had been. There was no prosthetics. There was no treatment that had been administered to the face under the mask, which I think was at least from what you could tell, it was scarred. Yeah, over. yeah. It, it was, was just the like, idea of I'm just building a whole new face and nose, stretching it over. Uh, boom. Yeah. All of yeah. that, it was like there wasn't really any effort other than let me slap this on top here. And well, and, I, and again, that that whole trope, at least, it, put it this way, it has it has meaning here in a way that it doesn't often. It's not given meaning in other right. places. That it becomes like you say, it's the thing that does whatever. It's like, well, this is a guy that goes around like messing up other people. And so for him to, you know, in yeah, a sense, have to deal with it has a has a little bit of a different again value. Because he doesn't yes. want to, you know, admit that he's, you know, in any way, shape, or form less than perfect. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. And I and I hope, you know, hopefully it's counterbalanced a bit by when you glimpse the uh, Rocket's friends uh, as they are now on some other plane or whatever. Mm-hmm. They didn't stop being, needing prosthetics and having like this, what would you say were imperfections? But yet the whole, once again, the whole point is they were perfect the way they are. Um, even after Kang's meddling. All of them were were good and whole as a as a yeah. You didn't see them in the afterlife as just regular bunny, regular odd, or yeah. regular. You know, like well, it, it wasn't that. It was like they were right. still the way that they left, kind of thing. And you know, the MCU too. For those that have you know, like maybe watched a lot of it, uh, that you pick up on is they have this kind of sweet little uh, principle, this little doctrine, or if you want to call it that of the afterlife that there does seem Mm -hmm. to be a place to be on some other plane. And, uh, it does also, it matches the, some of the expectations and hopes and desires of the person. If you watch moon Knight, there's an Egyptian barge and, you know, the Mm -hmm. gate to the afterlife. If you watch, uh, uh, rag, uh, well, uh, love and death, I guess is what, no, love and thunder. I'm sorry. Love and thunder. Yeah. Yeah. That, that Jane winds up in Valhalla and, you know, Mm -hmm. that there is this idea of continuing onward in a, pl- a plane of existence that is what you need it to be. And I just think that's a very interesting and kind of sweet natured uh, mm-hmm. thing to throw in there, you know, that, oh, what are they doing? They're flying the skies together, you know, just like they always planned. And we're here yeah. waiting for you when you finally do cross over here. And just a sweet thing to throw in there. Yeah, I think. yeah. no. Well, I, and, and that's the other part that's interesting too, because it, again, it's this idea of what he had hoped to do and how he had expected to save everyone. And instead in the act of saving them, it cost them all their lives. And, and so there's, so he's walking around with, again, all, all like you suddenly see all the layers and layers of baggage that, you know, that, that rocket is walking around with. And then in, again, in the, in the end, that idea of the rescuing. And so they, they save all the kids and then it's like the, no, no, we got to go back for every, everything else. And it's all the, you know, all the creatures, the animals, but it's that yeah. idea that he sees that he's like, he is in fact a North American raccoon yes. and that it's the I'm rocket <laughs> raccoon. So yes. he, again, so that self-acceptance. Okay, fine. I'm tired of people calling me all these other things and are calling me. He's like, 
nope, this is who I am. And, and he owns it. And, and I think that was the other part too, is that you, you, you saw that self-acceptance on a number of, of levels. And I think it's a lot like, um, guardians, uh, sorry, guardians is a lot like quantum mania. We talked about this bringing in new worlds and new realms. So yes, you've got the spaceship stuff, but then you've got like, again, the weird icky things that are happening again with these experiments, but then you've also got like the weird bio organic world. <laughs> And the whole oh, that was so yeah, freaky. Going, going yeah. into the weird trippy places. Weird and at trippy, first it was like part of me going, what's that? Like what yeah. happened with like, the props department budget that, with what Nathan Fillion is wearing and his crew. And then at the same time, you realize that it's like, oh, wait a second. There is a level of like gross discomfort, like just what this world yeah, represents. Yeah. So therefore it kind of makes sense that it's, it's literally it is a weird, gross, deformed kind of place and perspective that exists there. And they've managed to manifest it in a way where you're just like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this yes. doesn't look like it fits in the MCU at first. Oh, oh. wait a second. It kind of does. <laughs> awesome and gross at the same time. I, and I love when alien things actually appear alien to where it's yeah. like, I don't get this. But it is interesting to see how this might have grown from, you know, from that that culture, that world. I yeah. really enjoyed the speaking of the self acceptance. The we we saw a lot more of the mantis that was in the Christmas special, uh, yeah. which is very you know the more more self assured uh, in some ways and more the authenticity of being that character of having a certain level of like compassion, kindness, and instead of naivete, which I think was how you know you, she was sold when we it. first met her. You know, it's not so much that. And as she pushes back, you know, and for me, it's weird because it was funny, and but it was also very interesting the way that confrontation she has with Nebula and the way that mm -hmm. she works things in here and there to say, you know, to basically say that that she's not a weak character, right? She may seem yeah. childlike, whimsical, have compassion, um, silly even at times. But then I I really enjoyed how she utilized her skills and her talents to actually rescue the big the big monsters that that were the battery eaters you know from from yeah, yeah. Two. well and, and that's the other part too is that yeah how again they're it's like oh my god these things are out to get us and it's like no these, they're just scared of us and the next thing you know she's got three pets kind of thing yes um or three, what, three friends three what three minions whatever you want to call them she's got sidekicks now and well and it reminds me a lot of um I rewatched Captain Marvel recently and it was that idea that remember, uh, you know, Jan Rog telling her about, about controlling emotions and whether realizing that no, 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 actually her emotions are what in a sense unleashes her powers. Mm -hmm. And this was that same kind of thing where it was that same kind of coming into one's own and just, and, and the fact too, that she said that she needed to go off on her own because she's like, I either did, you know, what literally what my dad wanted to do. Like I was always doing what ego wanted and great that you guys saved me. But then it was like, I'm always doing what the guardians want to do. Now I got to figure out what I want to do. Yeah. You know, exactly. and, 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 and I think that's another really important thing as well is that how often, again, especially if you've come up with any kind of childhood neglect, abuse, et cetera, if you've been in some kind of, you know, hugely dysfunctional family where your boundaries and your needs and your emotions were not valued or they were only valued in however they could serve the larger, you know, ecosystem there, um, that, yeah, you you didn't realize that you were doing these things, but it was like, oh, wait a second. It's always what this thing wants. Oh, okay. Well, now I've moved into, and I would say the guardian sort of represents like going from childhood to like the, the adult, the work world, the whatever. Oh, you know, it was first it was about what dad wanted. Now it's about what work wants. And wait a second. What the hell about me? You know, so, That's really you know she, I don't know what I like and I want to do. And you know what? I'm allowed to go off and do it. And don't worry. I've got these three big things, you know, that I know that are like, again, like puppy dogs and I can... You know, but they'll scare the crap out of anybody else, so I'm good. They got my back. Like, you know? <laughs> and so uh, one of the the last points I wanted to hit before before we uh, run out of time for today is that I and I missed this the first time. I've seen it. I've seen it twice now in the theater. But I, <laughs> the first time when Groot speaks up at the end and says, "I love you guys," instead of "I am Groot," I <sighs> interpreted that as, "Oh, Groot's talking in English." However, reading a little bit on, and I, apparently Gunn has said this was the intention. It's not that. Because right before that, Gamora somehow like understands him. She's bonded with him enough. She accepts him enough. And the message is, now all of us as the audience 
we've clued into Gru. We understand I am, or, or sorry. Yeah, Gru, we're hearing not, what he's saying, not saying Gru. I am Groot. Yeah, we hear, I love you guys, which is what him, if anybody who didn't know him walking in there would have heard, I am Groot. And so we're mm-hmm. invited in to that. And I, I just thought, once again, that's a sweet natured, you know, for someone who can be just as snarky as this particular filmmaker can be and, and have some mean-spirited humor that is still very funny, don't get me mm-hmm. wrong, but, you know, it the the ability to weave in just how much heart the story had. And I think it... <sighs> revolved around that kind of self, that acceptance of, of who one is. And I guess you could yeah. say Groot, of all people, is very accepting of himself. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and, and that's the whole thing is that he's, you know, he's got that. And, and, and again, we've seen that evolution of who Groot is. And I mean, I, I think of even some of the shorts and, and that idea that you're so used to him saying something. And, you know, it's always saying, you know, I am Groot. And then somebody gives back an answer that gives you the context. Mm-hmm. So they understand and, and that, I, I mean, I have to admit there was one time because my default settings for watching so many K-dramas and Korean things is to have things in Korean, um, you know, on the audio. And I, I, I got like three quarters of the way through one of those I Am Brood episodes before I realized it was in Korean because another character finally said anything yeah. because I had been hearing I Am Brood, you know, non, non Groot. But, it, it, it didn't it didn't register like I was so familiar with the Korean that it was just like I was hearing it the same way and then it was somebody else said it and like oh wait a second I've been listening to this in Korean <laughs> so you it, it, it's it, it reminded me of that thing that like you say about yeah. the not understanding understanding kind of thing where you or you read into it and and so yeah that's that's a cool thing because I love that line for the fact that yeah it's the oh wait a second we get what Groot's saying Groot's totally cool with who he is um, I loved how they've set it up for the next thing as well in terms of them all there. Uh, you know, that those those folks there, and again, they're all sitting on group, but they're talking about music. The fact that you've got Adam there. Oh, God, Adam's a whole other level of, again, redemption and self-acceptance because he has literally been this tool. And and, and I'll say that with both senses of the word. I yeah. like with Modoc and Darren the Dick, you know. Um, but, I will um, say and too, just that, uh, that, that, that realizing that, you know, yeah. he was given a second chance. Like, why didn't you kill him? So that idea that they all sat there at the end, you see the next iteration that it's, while well, again, it's, it's gone leaving, but music has gone all the way through it. And so he ends it on the musical note of, you know, favorite bands, favorite performances, that kind of stuff. So you get the introduction and you get to see Rocket as the leader and walking in mm-hmm. and just that idea of that. So no, I think it's, it's been, awesome to have those things in there. And then the fact that you still get to see, you know, Rocket and Groot are your, your continuity. Um, and well, and even Nebula too, like that, her level of self-acceptance. And, and again, at that same thing, and going back to tropes, like, again, music has always been really important. So, I mean, like, oh my God, like no sleep till Brooklyn. <laughs> oh my God. The best. Um, so that whole scene, you know, well, as soon as I heard that come on, I was just like, was like again, oh I've boy. loved some of the other musical things, but <laughs> give me the Beastie Boys and that scene, yeah. brilliant. But yes. then when you get to the end and you get Florence and the Machine and Dark Days are over and the fact that they show the dancing and on one level you go, okay, well, it's kind of cheesy, sort of like well, some other things. Like, oh, a wait thing. a second. Like, and With, it's like, it's yeah. cheesy, but it's not cheesy because yes. we're going returning to the motif of both dancing Groot. Mm-hmm. And then also that idea of, again, other things, you know, you know, not dancing because dancing's not cool. Dancing's not this, not that. And it was the idea of, no, like this is, again, the acceptance, the shaking off the baggage. And he, and again, especially in the case of Drax, he's no longer a destroyer. He's a dad. So he's just goofy dad dancing with all his new kids. And, and again, Nebula, okay, I'm not this fighting machine that's been like deconstructed, rebuilt. I mean, the whole thing about her eyes. You know, it's like my dad ripped those out for punishment. <laughs> he picked a nice shade. He's like, just stop, stop, Peter. Just stop. Dig well, up. Ultimately, um, you know, the, so the, that the, idea that she's seen that she's been able to organically help yes. and she's got a kind of acceptance. The uh, and, and I think one of the core elements that made this particular corner, this franchise within the MCU, so uh, enjoyable and rewatchable. One of the more some of the some of their best movies are not as rewatchable because they're so heavy, um, yeah. or at least not you know just for fun watchable. Uh, come at me, people! I guess we can debate that. Yeah. But uh, with the Guardians franchise, ultimately it's about loyalty and joy. Like as much mm-hmm. as they are open and trash and and snipe at each other, uh, there is a certain loyalty, d- deep loyalty, and joy. And so I thought as 
as many people, you know, there there's sometimes has been a trope of showcasing a little dance party at the end of movies. It's a it's an easy way to get mm-hmm. people to go, oh, cool. Uh, at the yeah. end, I don't. Some people don't like it. I don't have a problem with it, really. Usually, but in this case, I thought it was a perfect like. Like, let me put it this way: one of the best uses of dancing at the end of a movie since uh, no spo- I don't think this is a spoiler. Since Jojo Rabbit, for anyone who's seen yes. that, you know, dancing plays a very pivotal role in the last ten seconds of that movie. Mm-hmm. It really ties <laughs> together uh, the emotions of it. And so, yeah, I just felt very, very powerful uh, kind of thing. And the acceptance of one's family. In Gamora's yeah. case, a, new, a different new family because she's a different new person. But, you know, mm-hmm. having having that kind of self-acceptance and being able to move onward, uh, both those who we'll see again in the story and those who we won't, that we just know uh, that there is that. And they don't have to die. They don't have to – they can retire, move on, and be heroes in a different mm-hmm. way. Peter can go visit his, you know, go, go stay with grandpa and learn all these different things. Well, and that's the other part too, is it's about family and the different iterations of family. Yeah. So we've had like, you know, again, those families, you know, like Hawkeye's family, or again, you see what happens with, you know, again, Tony Stark, again, parents and that relationship, but also coming into his own family. And, and, and this, you know, for me, guardians have always been about the, if not entirely chosen family, um, the family that you end up building around you in some way, shape or form. Again, some folks come into your life and there's no choice. You're, you're, you're stuck together um, <laughs> and other, and other people you choose or accept or whatever, but it's that idea of, of, you know, um, n- not about, you know, biological family of origin, those kinds of things. So with, with our winding up today, tell everybody what's yeah. going on with, uh, with speak up and your, mo- your movements and your, uh, work that uh, you're doing, where can people, uh, um, well, people I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward doing? to heading to, um, I'm going to be at a tech conference in Detroit with, um, uh, some merit. There's some of the original folks back in the day that started the internet, um, <laughs> under a different name, but the back in the sixties. So, um, they're having a boldly go uh, their annual member uh, community conference. So I will be speaking about um, the superpowers associated with our diagnoses there. And uh, yeah, just doing some other things in that regard. And as always, there's, you know, evolutions happening on the website, but it's it's going out there and preaching the geek girl gospel of um, the superpowers that exist within our diagnoses and overcoming that misrepresentation of the don't call my, you know, as soon as somebody says, you know, don't call my diagnosis a superpower, it sucks. I'm like, oh, tell me, you know, nothing about superheroes without telling me because (laughs) (laughs) superpowers always come with something that sucks. And and, and it's about overcoming, uh, embracing, understanding and empowering ourselves and having others accept us. So, so much of it is about self-acceptance, building community and looking after each other and, uh, finding the rockets and the groots in our lives. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.